If it had not been for the Lord who reached out to us, we, we would have perished, perished in our own selfishness. Yes. If it had not been for the Lord who healed our wounds, we, we would have succumbed to pain and, and sorrow. sorrow. Praise be to God who reaches out to us, healing and restoring our lives. All, All thanks be to God, God for the many ways in which our lives have been blessed. Oh, Amen. And no, this isn't quite ready yet. Um, turn to hymn number one, um, How Great Thou Art. All right, we'll sing at Acapulco. Ready? <laughs> oh, Lord my God, when I am awesome wonder, consider all the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul,
Oh, oh really? Right oh, wow. <laughs> why have they? Why have we sang now? <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. Well, please look to the bulletin and let's all pray together. Lord, open our hearts to the surprising ways in which you offer to us your love and your presence. Help us to truly believe in the wondrous ways that you work in our lives. Give us hearts and spirits for service to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning's scripture lesson is Psalm 36. Here we go. Hear the word of the Lord. An oracle is within my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for in his own eyes he flatters himself. Too much to detect or hate his sin. The words of his mouth are wicked and deceitful. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. Even on his bed he plots evil. He commits himself to a sinful course and does not reject what is wrong. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains your justice like the great deep. O Lord, you preserve both man and beast. How priceless is your unfailing love, both high and low among men. Find refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Continue your love to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. May the foot of the proud not come against me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. See how the evildoers lie fallen, thrown down, not able to rise. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we've got the song that I've talked about a couple of times that wasn't able to play, uh, just didn't work. I'm happy to say it does work this week. So uh, I think you'll like this one, I really do. It's just called Song of Job. It's kind of a fun one, a little bit upbeat, has a lot of interesting sort of funny pictures and graphics. Uh, just enjoy it. It tells uh, pretty much the whole story.
riches Job has fallen. Come, let us go and give him what we can. chapter 31 today, uh, 31, 32, and 33. And at this point, Job has pretty well talked down all of his friends. Bildad had the last word, and Job is still responding, <laughs> as he has been responding, just generally now to all his friends. And this last discourse of Job that we're in the middle of here is his longest discourse. And he kind of goes on and on with it. And then his next responses will be to God himself. But here, Job is talking about his own righteousness, his own goodness, his works, which he has done. And he said... I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? For what portion of God is there from above? And what inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is not destruction to the wicked? And strange punishment to the doers of iniquity? Doth he not see my ways and count all my steps? If I have walked with vanity, or if my foot has hasted to deceit, let me be weighed in an even balance, that God may know my integrity. If my step hath turned out of the way, and my heart walked after my eyes, and if any blot hath cleaved to my hands, then let me sow, and let another eat. Yea, let my offspring be rooted out. If my heart hath been deceived by a woman, or if I have laid wait at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind unto another, and let others bow down upon her, for this is a heinous crime. Yea, it is an iniquity to be punished by the judges. It's a fire that consumes to destruction, and would root out all mine increase. 
So Job here is continuing to review his own record of righteousness, and he makes some 16 or more propositions, beginning with, if I had committed some sin, such as, and ending with, then I should be appropriately judged and chastised. He insisted that he was innocent of all such sins, and these are things that Job's friends have been hinting that he was guilty of, but he's denying his guilt. I have made a covenant before God. I'm not going to look on another woman. I'm going to be not going to be interested in other women. You know, Jesus said, if a man looks upon a woman to desire after her, he has committed adultery already in his heart. And Job says, I made a covenant. I'm not going to look on other women. I'll be satisfied with my wife. And he basically says, now if I've been guilty of adultery, then the punishment of my wife committing adultery with someone else would be a punishment that I deserved. But I'm innocent of these things. Let God weigh me in balances. Let it be fair. Let what I have received be fair from God. I'm receiving more now than I deserve, for I haven't been guilty of these things. He's saying. And then he goes on in verse 13 saying, if I did despise the cause of my manservant or maidservant when they contended with me, what shall I do when God rises up? For he visiteth, and what shall I answer him? Did not he that made me in the womb make him? And did not one fashion us in the womb? So Job is speaking here of the fact that he had not really lorded over his servants, that he looked upon them as equals. We were both, all of us, created by God in the womb, he says. Because, you know, it's really a tragedy when men begin to think themselves superior to others, rather than realizing that all of us, have been created by God and are equal. And in God's eyes, there is no ranking, there's no superiorities. And that, of course, goes for male and female. It goes for servants and free men. We're all one in Christ. And yet, it seems that man is always trying to exalt or elevate himself above others which causes many or most of the world's problems and tragedies. Job said that he dealt honestly with his servants when they argued with him. He looked upon them honestly because he said, we all came out of the womb. I'm no better than they are. And he also recognized that God takes up the cause of the poor. And God brings vengeance upon those who oppress the poor. He says, if I have with, withheld the poor from their desire or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, if I have eaten my morsel myself alone and the fatherless hath not eaten thereof, if I have seen any perish for want of clothing or any poor without covering, if his loins have not blessed me, and if he were not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have lifted up my hand against the fatherless when I saw my help in the gate, then let my arm fall from my shoulder blade and my arm be broken from the bone. If I'm guilty of these things, he says, of not helping the poor, if I've allowed people to go naked, if I've allowed people to go hungry while I was living in luxury, then let my arms fall off. That's what he literally says. Job is kind of bringing curses on himself here. If I'm guilty of these things, he says, then let these horrible things happen to me. And you know, in that culture, it's interesting that hospitality 
is so important, especially back in those days. Uh, if a person was traveling, especially, you notice how Abraham and Genesis entertained people like that. Um, the angels who were traveling by, he, he invited in. He didn't know they were angels, just travelers, stra tra strangers traveling by him. And yet he said, come on in. It's late. Spend the night here. Let my wife fix you something to eat. So hospitality was an important thing, and it should be an important thing in the church too. Paul tells us that when we choose people as overseers of the body of Christ, that we should pick out men and women who have shown themselves to be hospitable. And he continues, verse 23, saying, For destruction from God was a terror to me. And by reason of his highness, I could not endure. If I had made gold my hope, or have said to the fine gold, Thou art my confidence. If I rejoiced because my wealth was great, and because mine hand had gotten much. If I beheld the sun when it shined, or the moon walking in its brightness, and my heart hath been secretly enticed, or my mouth had kissed my hand, this also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge, for I should have denied the God that is above. It's kind of interesting here that Job seemed to understand that the moon does not emit its own light, but reflects the light of the sun. They thought they were their own separate lights back there, but he seems to differentiate between the shining of the sun and refers to the moon merely walking in the sun's brightness, which is pretty interesting. And then he says, uh, verse 31, I've not allowed my mouth to sin by wishing a curse to another man's soul. If the man of my tent said not, Oh, that we had of his flesh, we cannot be satisfied. The stranger did not lodge in the street, but I opened my doors to the travelers. If I covered my transgression as Adam, it's interesting there that he mentions Adam too. Uh, so evidently the stories of Adam were widely circulated even by the time of Job. So, says here he's aware of Adam's attempt to cover his sin by sowing fig leaves. So he said, uh, if I covered my transgression as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, did I fear a great multitude, or did the contempt of families terrify me that I kept silence and went not out of the door? so surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown unto me. He said, I would declare unto him the number of my steps. As a prince, I would go near unto him. If my land cry against me, or that the furrows likewise thereof complain, if I have eaten the fruit thereof without money, or have caused the owners thereof to lose their life, let thistles grow instead of wheat, and the cockle instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. I've had it, he says, that's it. I'm innocent. I don't care what you all say. And that's the final declaration of his innocence that he makes before his friends. And then, in chapter 32... <clears throat> we see that sitting nearby was a young man whose name was Elihu. And it goes on in 32 to say, So these three men, Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz, ceased to answer Job, because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu against Job, and his wrath was kindled because Job justified himself rather than God. Now Job in all of his complaints was saying, I'm just in all of this. I am innocent. 
and he was justifying himself rather than God. We oftentimes do this, don't we? You know, it's important, though, that we stop and realize God is involved. Justify him. I know that God is good. I know that God is righteous. I know he's fair and that he has reasons for what he does and does not do. But you see, at this point, Job was not justifying God in these issues by declaring, well, God is fair. He wasn't saying that. He was saying God is unfair. He's unfair to me because I haven't done anything to deserve all of this. So Elihu, standing by, became angry with Job because he sought to justify himself rather than to justify God. And he was also angry with Job's friends because they could not answer Job. They couldn't really pin anything on him, and yet they were condemning him without being able to pin anything directly on him. It goes on here in verse 4, saying, so he waited until Job had spoken, because they were older than he was. And when he saw that they were not answering, his wrath was kindled. And he said, I am young, and you are very old. Wherefore I was afraid, and I dared not to show you my own opinion. I said, Days should speak, and the multitude of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty gives them understanding. And great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. And Elihu makes some interesting points here. There is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty gives them understanding. He could see the anointing of God upon a man to give to the man wisdom and understanding. But great men are not always wise. And we can certainly see that in our world, can't we? Therefore I said, hearken to me, I'm going to show you my opinion. And he spends a lot of time just telling us what he's going to say. He doesn't really say too much for a while, but he spends a lot of time telling you what he's going to say. Hearken to my opinion. Behold, I waited for your words to give ear to your reasons while you searched out what to say. Yes, I attended unto you, and behold, there was none of you that convinced Job or that answered his words, lest you should say we have found out wisdom. God thrust him down, not man. Now he hath not directed his words against me, and neither will I answer him with your speeches. They were amazed, and they answered no more. They left off speaking. When I had waited, for they spake not, but stood still and answered no more, I said, I will also answer my part. I will show you my opinion, for I am full of the matter. The spirit within me is forcing me. And whatever or whoever this spirit he's talking about may have been, it was not God's Holy Spirit. For Elihu's spirit, he says, merely repeated some of the old false charges against Job that had been originated by that wicked spirit we heard in Eliphaz back in chapter 4. Now, he reworded and gave some of it new wrinkles, but they're basically the same lies. And he goes on, verse 11, to say, Behold, my belly is as wine, which has no vent. It is ready to burst like new bottles. I will speak, that I may be refreshed. I will open my lips and answer. Let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person, neither let me give flattering titles unto men. For I know not to give flattering titles. In so doing, my Maker would soon take me away. I like this part. 
because I've often thought, God, help me not give flattering titles unto men or accept them for myself. You know, we may uh, respect a person's age and experience or apparent achievement and learning, but we should not butter up and bow down to such people too much. And it can happen, we see it in the Christian community too, giving people flattering titles, declaring the greatness of their works and all. And we need God's help and wisdom there. Into chapter 33, we read, beginning with verse 1, Wherefore, Job, he said, I pray thee, now hear my speech, hearken to all my words, Behold, I've opened my mouth, my tongue has spoken in my mouth. My words shall be of uprightness of my heart, and my lips shall utter knowledge clearly. He keeps saying it, doesn't he? The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. You can answer me, set your words in order before me, stand up. Behold, I am according to your wish in God's stead. Well, there I think he's going a little too far. See, Job was saying earlier, I wish there was someone between us, you know, who could lay his hand on me and tell me what's right and what God's really doing. And Elihu seems to be saying, here I am. I'm what you wished for. I'm standing here in God's stead. So he's starting to flatter himself now here when he was just telling Job not to do that. I am also formed out of the clay. Behold, my terror shall not make thee afraid, neither shall my hand be heavy upon thee. Surely you have spoken in my hearing. I have heard the voice of your words saying, <coughs> and now he's quoting Job, I have heard you say, I am clean without transgression, I am innocent, neither is there any iniquity in me. And he heard Job saying about God, Behold, he finds occasions against me, he counts me for his enemy, he puts my feet in the stocks, he marks all my paths. Behold, in this Job you are not just, I will answer thee that God is greater than man. Why do you strive against him? For he gives not account of any of his matters. He doesn't owe you an apology, Job, is what he's saying. And that's true. God doesn't owe me any apologies, no explanations. You know, Paul said concerning God that he is as a potter, and we as are the clay. And what right does the clay have to say to the potter, why have you made me like this? Why did you put that wrinkle in me? You know, I have no right to challenge God. Okay? As a lump of clay, the potter has sovereignty over my life. He can make of me whatever he wants to make of me and do with me whatever he wants to do with me. He can make me a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. He can make me a drinking cup or a garbage pail. You know, he has absolute power over, over my life. He doesn't owe me explanations, even though I sometimes demand that he does. You know, give me a reason, God. You know, he really doesn't owe any of us explanations. That's what Elihu was saying. God can do whatever he wants with us. And I need to stop flattering myself and honor his majesty. Okay? Elihu declares, verse 14, For God has spoken once, yes, twice, yet man did not perceive it. In a dream and in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, in slumberings on the bed, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instructions, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. 
He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. God speaks, he says, once. He speaks twice. Well, how does God speak? He speaks sometimes through dreams. He speaks through visions. God can speak in various ways to different people. And I think, though, that our hearts need to be open to hear the voice of God. You know, sometimes I believe that God is speaking and does speak quite often, and we just don't understand what he's saying. We don't understand how to hear his voice. You know, so many of us think that we have to hear this big, booming voice calling our name, you know, Brian, you know, that reverberates all <laughs> over the place, and then we'll know God's speaking to me. But, no, he can speak to us through dreams or visions. He can speak to us through angels. He can speak to us and does through his word. He can speak to us through a friend. Many different ways, and you can't really limit the ways by which God speaks to man, I think is the point. He continues. He is chastened also with pain upon his bed, that is man and the multitude of his bones with strong pain, so that his life pours bread, and his soul dainty meat. His flesh is consumed away, and it cannot be seen, and his bones that were not, they stick out. And he's sort of describing Job's condition now. Man, you know you're in pain. Your bones are sticking out, and your health is taken away and all. God is trying to speak to you, Job, he's saying. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show man his uprightness, then he is gracious unto him. And he says, deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him. And he shall see his face with joy, and he'll render unto man his righteousness. He looks upon men, and if any say, I have sinned, and perverted that, book, that which was right, and it profited me not, he will deliver his soul. Stop flattering yourself, Job, he says. If you'll only confess, then... He'll deliver your soul from the pit, and your life shall see the light. Lo, these things God works oftentimes with man, to bring back his soul from the pit, to be enlightened with the light of the living. Mark well, O Job, hearken unto me. Hold thy peace, and I'm going to speak. And if you have anything to say, then answer, speak, for I desire to justify thee. If not, then listen to me, hold your peace, and I'm going to teach you wisdom. So this young kid is telling Job, if you've got anything to say, say it. If not, then just let me talk, because I'm going to teach you a few things here. <laughs> but you know, what he's basically saying is actually pretty sound, and that is, that God oftentimes uses chastisement to turn us away from the pit. And you know, as a child of God, you're really in a very good situation. <laughs> because God's not going to let you get away with evil. You know, you can see everyone all around you getting away with it, but that's because they're not children of God. But because he's your father and he's watching over you, he's not going to let you get away with wickedness, perversity, or crookedness. And God uses chastisement to keep his children out of the pit. God will stop you. He'll allow you to get caught and corrected. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. 
from Hebrews chapter 12. And if you are not chastened, then you're like a bastard. You're not really his son. You know, if you can do evil and get away with it, then I would be very worried if I were you. If you know you can cheat and get away with it, then you have reason to really be worried. But if you're a child of God, he won't let you get off scot-free. You're going to get caught and pay some price sooner than later. And that's because he's trying to save you from the snare, from the pit. So stop flattering yourselves, amen? <laughs> Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. In the strong name of Jesus, amen. amen. Now, that's what I know. <laughs> some, some I know and some I don't know. Oh, that's it. Here we go.
humble yourself before the Lord, and He will lift you up. Shalom Amen. to you. Shalom to you. Amen.